Thank you, Barbara. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. Uh, so we're in the chapter called We Agnostics, and we're starting tonight really at the very, very bottom line of page 47. And We Agnostic is a chapter that basically tells us all we need to know about step two. First learn that it was going to take something more than human power to get over our alcoholism. And that power is going to be a, a power greater than ourselves. Um, and in AA, we like to call that God. But it's hard for a lot of us coming in as agnostics, atheists, it's hard for us to sort of accept God as a higher power and to think that God has something to do with our lives and it is actually personal to us. It takes a little work for us to do that. This chapter tells us how to do that work so that we get to be able to have a power good in ourselves that will restore us to sanity. So last week, we got to the final question on page 47, where it says, do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? One simple question that we have to decide in that the last sentence in that particular paragraph says, it has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. So this is a process. It doesn't happen all at one time. You begin to be open-minded. We talked last night, last week, a lot about being open-minded to new ideas and not to be prejudiced with the, our old ideas about God, about spirituality, about terms that we hear all the time. We try to learn not to, to keep those bad ideas, get rid of them and put in some new ideas <clears throat> that'll help us grow. And it's great news to everybody that we can start on a very simple level. It doesn't have to be the whole kit and caboodle at one time. It's just one, you know, just start with the smallest amount and let that grow. And one of the problems we have is with faith, with developing a faith in such a power. We didn't have faith in a lot when we were out there drinking, you know, when we were active in al our alcoholism and so now we're going to have to have a little bit of faith and it's kind of hard to muster up that faith and figure out how to get that working in our lives so we'll talk about that a little bit tonight so on the very bottom page of page 47 the last sentence the last line it says besides a seeming inability to accept much on faith we often found ourselves handicapped by obstinacy, sensitiveness, and unreasoning prejudice. Many of us have been so touchy that even casual reference to spiritual things made us bristle with antagonism. This sort of thinking had to be abandoned. Though some of us resisted, we found no great difficulty in casting aside such feelings. Faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became an open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on other questions. In this respect, alcohol was a great persuader. Sometimes this was a tedious process. We hope no one else will be prejudiced for as long as some of us were. So... Going from not having faith, not having a higher power, not having a concept of your own higher power, without any of that, it can be a tedious process. It takes a while. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be fully uh, realized in your life in, you know, a couple of meetings. It's going to take a lot longer than that. It's going to take a lot of reading in the big book and other AA literature. It's going to take being at a lot of meetings and trying to grasp little bits and pieces at a time and let that grow in you. And that's a little hard sometimes. But it doesn't have to take forever and it doesn't have to be that difficult once we start realizing that we've always had 
a tremendous amount of faith in our lives. We just didn't realize it as faith. We have faith in our electrical system because we walk into a room, flip on the light switch, and the lights come on. And it happens almost every time. Once in a blue moon, either a bulb burns out or the power goes off. But otherwise, that switch always works. And we have faith that it's going to work. And we turn on the lights. We have faith in, you know, an airline pilot. We go get on an airplane and we fly to California and never even think about it. But we have to have faith that that guy knows what he's doing, that he's well-trained, that he's not drunk, that he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, and that he's going to get us there safely. And we get on the plane and go to sleep. So we have faith. We have faith all around us. We just don't always call it faith. So it continues. The reader may still ask why he should believe in a power greater than himself. We think there are good reasons. Let us have a look at some of them. The practical individual of today is a stickler for facts and results. Nevertheless, the 20th century readily accepts theories of all kinds, provided they are firmly grounded in fact. We have numerous theories, for example, about electricity. Everybody believes them without a murmur of doubt. Why this ready acceptance? Simply because it is impossible to explain what we see, feel, direct, and use without a reasonable assumption as a starting point. So since that light bulb has always come on, we have a reasonable assertion that it's going to come on again. But it has to start with the fact that we see electric light bulbs. And we know it exists. Now, most people don't know what electricity is, how it works, where it comes from, why it works. They don't understand that that copper wire is a solid thing. It's not a tube that the electricity runs through. It's a condu conduit where the electricity actually runs on the outside of that wire. But we don't see the wires because they're in our walls. And if they come out of the wall through a, a receptacle, they're inside another cord. And we never actually see the wires. So, but it works just the same. So we have faith in it that it's going to work. Everybody nowadays believes in scores of assumptions for which there is good evidence, but no perfect visual proof. And does not science demonstrate that visual proof is the weakest proof? It is being constantly revealed as mankind studies the material world that outward appearances are not inward reality at all. To illustrate. The prosaic steel girder is a mass of electrons whirling around each other at incredible speed. These tiny bodies are governed by precise laws. And these laws uh, hold true throughout the material world. Science tells us so. We have no reason to doubt it. When, however, the perfectly logical assumption is suggested that underneath the material world, and life as we see it, there is an all-powerful, guiding, creative intelligence. Right there, our perverse streak comes to the surface, and we laboriously set out to convince ourselves it isn't so. We read wordy books and indulge in windy arguments, thinking we believe this universe needs no God to explain it. Were our intentions true? It would follow life that life originated out of nothing, means nothing, and proceeds nowhere. That steel girder, and this baffled me when I started looking into some scientific things in my life, and especially actually when I read this. You know, the, the big book talks about some things that haven't happened yet, like flying to the moon hadn't happened yet. And airplanes were brand new on the scene. You know, most of the travel was done through steamboat. But there were planes beginning to fly around uh, in this time when this book was written. 
uh, and steel was around, of course. But when they started looking into steel and, and, and they, t- they had this atomic microscopes, they can look at the structure of steel and blow it up really big. And when they did, there's, they see molecules and atoms in the steel. And the atom is a neutron and a photon in, in, the, in the middle, a neutron and something else. And then they have the electrons going around. And when you look at one of those atoms and blow it up big enough where you can really see it, what's in that atom is mostly space. The space from the center out to where the electrons are running around is just empty space. And then when you break down and you look at the neutron inside that atom and you blow that up really big and really look at it with a really powerful microscope and blow it up, it's made up of a lot of little particles too. But those particles are far apart in relationship to each other inside that neutron. And when they blow it up even bigger in in this process that these scientists are doing to get at what they call the God particle, they were looking for quarks, these little tiny, tiny, tiny things, smallest things we know of that are part of what the inside of an atom is like. And they took these particles and they're incredibly minuscule. And they took them and they put them in this thing called an uh, electron accelerator, a big circle, and they got them going a half a million miles an hour, really accelerated these things up, sent one one way around this big circle, sent one the other way around this big circle. And when they got them up at full speed, they crashed them together and they exploded. And they went in to look for the debris of where were those two particles? What did those two particles become? And they found nothing. You know, if you see two cars come crashing together, what you have is a big pile of debris that still looks kind of like two cars. But when they did these particle accelerators and blew up these two particles, there was nothing left. But yet, if you put all those molecules and all those particles and all those electrons and you put all those together and and put them into a steel beam, you know, drop it on your foot, it'll crush your foot. But how does something that has so much space in it, so much empty space, how can that weigh the same as a steel girder weighs? So the so our evidence of steel is not exactly what the truth is. The truth is that that steel girder is mostly space. We tap on it and bang on it with a hammer and it clangs and it seems rock solid. But it's mostly space. So our perceptions sometimes are not what we what is really the truth. Our eyes deceive us. What we see is not always what the truth is. So it's, you know, so that looking at spirituality is the same way. What we see in our material world, the, you know, the computers we're on right now, the lights, everything, the house, the walls, everything that's out here in the material world is all made up of a, in a three-dimensional world. But yet Bill talks about a fourth dimension, a fourth dimension we can't see. It's invisible to us, but it's our spirituality. It's another realm. It's another layer of our reality that we just can't see. The same way as we can't see electricity. We see the results of electricity, but we don't see electricity. We see the results of believing in God and spiritual matters. We see the results but we don't see the spirituality actually. And we don't see God. But we, and so some people have a problem with believing in that, but it's there and it's true. There is a God and and there is a fourth dimension of that spirituality, which is above and beyond our human material world. It's where our mind is, not our brain, but our mind. So when we start having these issues with with knowing God, believing in God, seeing the evidence of God, seeing spirituality in our life, we just have to go beyond the limitations of 
show me. I'll believe it when you show me. Because some of this stuff can't be seen. So we have to be open-minded to that. It goes on to say, instead of regarding ourselves as intelligent agents, spearheads of God's ever-advancing creation, we agnostic and atheists chose to believe that our human intelligence was the last word, the alpha and the omega, uh, the beginning and end of it all. Rather vain of us, wasn't it? So believing that our thoughts, our beliefs, our intelligence is the mastermind of the universe is, you know, is very off base. There is much more intelligence beyond us. We who have traveled this dubious path beg you to lay aside prejudice even against organized religion. We have learned that whatever the human frailty, frailties of various faiths may be, those faiths have given purpose and direction to millions. People of faith have a logical idea of what life is all about. Actually, we used to have no reasonable conception whatever. We used to amuse ourselves by cynically dissecting spiritual beliefs and practices when we might have observed that many spiritually minded persons of all races, colors, and creeds were demonstrating a degree of stability, happiness, and usefulness which we should have sought ourselves. So our inner conflicts with trying to prove things sometimes is not as rewarding as accepting things on a spiritual level and living them and being happy and useful without the worry and, and, and trying to explain each and everything that happens to us. So in spirituality, that's what we have to do. We have to learn to recognize the evidence and see the evidence and feel the evidence without seeing anything physically. So on page 50, it starts out. Instead, we looked at the human defects of these people and sometimes used their shortcomings as a basis for wholesale condemnation. We talked of intolerance while we were intolerant ourselves. We missed the reality and the beauty of the forest because we were diverted by the ugliness of some of its trees. We never gave the spiritual side of life a fair hearing. So in order to grow, we have to start realizing that the spiritual life is there. It's not a theory. It really exists. And we have to accept that in. You know, we have to let these things happen without question. Let them be. That spirituality is there. We should be seeking, as we learned last week, to be seeking God. And as we seek God, we see the evidence of his existence. We see how he is in our lives. And we don't have to explain it. We just have to know it's there. We just have to feel it. We just have to accept it in. So we just keep seeking. In our own personal stories, you will find a, a wide variation in the way each teller approaches and conceives of the power which is greater than himself. Whether we agree with a particular approach or concept seems to make little difference. Experience has taught us that these are matters be about which, for our purpose, we need not be worried. They are questions for each individual to settle for himself. So this seeking of spirituality is on your plate as an individual and you seek it you seek it as hard as you want or as little as you want you look for the evidence you see the evidence and you believe more and more as you see more evidence on one proposition however these men and women are strikingly agreed every one of them has gained access to and believes in 
a power greater than himself. This power has in each case accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible. As a celebrated American statesman put it, let's look at the record. So we're going to read a little bit about that. But we're all sitting here not drinking. In our whole lives, we tried. How many times did you try to quit drinking on your own? How many times did you try to get help from somebody to quit drinking, get encouraged, blah, 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 whatever. And we tried and we tried and we tried and we couldn't quit drinking. No matter what we did, even when we really, really wanted to quit drinking, we couldn't quit drinking. And then we come to AA and we sit in a room full of people who have been here for a while and who have found a power greater than themselves that could solve their problem. And they're happy, joyous, and free. And they're not craving drinks all the time. They're not thinking about alcohol unless they're in an AA meeting and we're talking about it. It's the only time I think about alcohol is when I'm in a meeting. But I go through my life on a day-to-day -day basis without ever even thinking about alcohol. It just doesn't come to mind. That is a miracle. For me, that's a miracle. Because I tried it, I tried it, I tried it. And I spent time not drinking, but I wasn't, I, I was doing it on my own. It lasted a short period of time. And every minute of the day, I wanted a drink. I just didn't have one for quite a while. But every day I wanted one until I came to AA, until I accepted a power greater than myself into my life. And then miraculously, I never want to drink anymore. But it's the miracle. And that's the evidence. It's something you've done, you've tried to do all your life and were never able to do it. You come into AA in a short period of time, you accomplish that by learning a few things from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and you quit drinking and you don't mind that you quit drinking. You kind of like the idea that, you did, that you're not drinking anymore. That's a miracle. That is evidence that a God exists because something that you've never been able to do suddenly got done. And when you think about it, you put in a lot more effort in your failures to quit than you did in your success to quit through AA because you found a power greater than yourself. And that power exists in these rooms. So let's take a look at the record. Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. They flatly declare, declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, to take a certain attitude towards that power, and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking. In the face of collapse and despair, in the face of the total failure of the human resources, they found that a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into them. This happened as soon as this happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. Once confused and baffled by the seeming futility of existence, they showed the underlying reasons why they were making heavy going of life. Leaving aside the drink question, they tell why living was so unsatisfactory. They show how the change came over them. When many hundreds of people are able to say that the consciousness of the presence of God is today the most important fact in their lives, they present a powerful reason why one should have faith. So that's a pretty powerful paragraph. Okay, when the people that come into AA, and all you have to do is change your attitude towards God, towards spiritual things, just have a little change of attitude, and do a few simple things. And, and look, they say that it's a revolutionary change in the way of living and thinking. Not about 
not drinking. Because we drank for emotional reasons, for all kinds of reasons that were mixed up because we didn't have the power to straighten that stuff out. And we come into AA and we find a higher power and we do just a few simple things. Suddenly we start thinking better and we start thinking better. We start realizing that drinking is not the answer. And we start living better. And when we live better, we have no reason to drink. Our reasons for drinking are removed. We we find a balance in AA that doesn't send us off one end or the other to where there's a drink. And that balance is important in Alcoholics Anonymous. So uh, it's really a, an interesting transformation that doesn't start in one day. It takes a while. So you have to go through it for a while. It can be a little tedious, but it doesn't have to be. If you just simply become open-minded, it eliminates the reasons that you have for not having faith. Faith comes. This world of ours has made more material progress in the last century than in all the millenniums which went before. Almost everyone knows the reason. Students of ancient history tell us the intellect of men in those days was equal to the best of today. Yet, in ancient times, material progress was painfully slow. The spirit of modern scientific inquiry, research, and invention was almost unknown. In the realm of the material, men's minds were fettered by superstition, tradition, and all sorts of fixed ideas. Some of the contemporaries of Columbus thought a round earth preposterous. Others came near to putting Galileo to death for his astronomical heresies. So simple things that we just take for granted in 2022 could get you killed back in the day. And all because of the way they thought, because they had prejudice, because they were afraid, because they allowed fear to to control them and they were afraid of new things so they just wanted to keep the status quo so when columbus tried to prove the world is round they wanted to kill him you know that was no good they didn't want him they didn't want to know when galileo saw the stars moving and said hey we're revolving around the sun they said, oh, no, that's not true. The sun goes around us. And they they got really mad at him for that. I mean, they tortured him. They punished him for having the right idea because he was open-minded. Columbus is open-minded. People that were open-minded were, had the right ideas. They were thinking better. Other people, based in prejudice and fear, didn't make it, didn't like it. We asked ourselves this, are not some of us just as biased and unreasonable about the realm of the spirit as were the ancients about the realm of the material? Even in the present century, American newspapers were afraid to print an account of the Wright brothers' first successful flight at Kitty Hawk. Had not all efforts at flight failed before? Did not Professor Langley's flying machine go to the bottom of the Potomac River? Was it not true that the best mathematical minds had proved that man could never fly? Had not people said God had reserved the privilege to the birds? Only 30 years later, the conquest of the air was almost an old story, and airplane travel was in full swing. So those are kind of old ideas that were going on before any of us were born. But what about, we're walking around these days with a telephone in our hands with no wires and it's everything we want. It's a watch, it's a calculator. I remember when I used to go to school, I had to take calculator, you had to wear a watch. You know, there's all kinds of stuff you had to carry in a book bag. Well, all of that is in my phone. I don't have a black book where I have phone numbers written down anymore. I don't even know my home phone number. 
All I know is push the button on my phone that says home and it dials it. I can say to my phone, instead of doing math on a calculator now, it's just, hey, Google, how much is 10 times 4,000? Boom, the answer is right there. I don't even have to do anything. If you would have told people a century ago that one day you're going to be walking around in the house and outside and riding in a car and talking on the phone, they'd have told you you were nuts. But nowadays, everybody has them. Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody does that stuff without even thinking about it. Think you're going to have a computer, a word processor, even later on. A word processor on a phone? You got to be kidding me. Watch movies on a telephone? Who ever heard of such a thing? Well, we do it now every single solitary day. So when we're talking about spiritual things, some of these, when you're brand new, you start talking about spiritual things and you think you're talking out the other side of your head. These spiritual things become, as you grow into spirituality, as you, you start to begin to understand there's a power greater than yourself that can help you out and help you quit drinking and help you live a better life. As that starts to happen in your life, it becomes second nature. You would never question it again. As long as you live, you'll never question it again. But in the beginning, we question it. We say, is this really true? Is this really going to happen? You know, is this really happening to me? There's a lot of things that are changing all the time. We grow with them in the physical world. Spirituality is never ending. No matter how much you know, there's tons more you can know. You have access to a lot of intellect that when it's time and you need that intellect, it'll come to you. If you have that connection to a higher power and that relationship with a higher power, that will enable you to get over your alcoholism, start thinking right, and living right. We'll go further with that next week. It's pretty awesome stuff. So thank you all for listening. Back to you, Barbara.